My name is Sam Wagner, and this is, this is the first part of two about language, definitions, context, and meaning. The first part is dedicated to the question of definitions. The sentence, all cats are black, is evidently untrue, even if only one cat in the whole universe were to be white. And so the property being black cannot form a part of the definition of a cat. The lesson to be learned is that definitions must be universal. They must apply to all members of a defined set, the set of all cats in our example. Let us try to define a chair. In doing so, we are trying to capture the essence of being a chair, its chairness. It is chairness that is defined, not this or that specific chair. This is the difference between intentionality and extensionality. We want to be able to identify chairness whenever and wherever we come across it. But chairness cannot be captured without somehow tackling and including the users of a chair, what it is made for. What does it do or help to do? In other words, a definition must include an operative part, a function. In many cases, the function of the definiendu, the term defined, constitutes its very meaning. The function of a vinyl record is its meaning. It has no meaning outside its function. The definience, the expression supplying the definition of a vinyl rock record both encompasses and consists of its function or use. And yet, can a vinyl record be defined in a vacuum without incorporated the incorporating the record player in the definience? After all, a vinyl record is an object containing audio information decoded by a record player. Without the record player bit, the definience becomes ambiguous. It can fit an audio cassette or a compact disc. So the context is essential and we will deal with it in the second part. A good definition includes a context which serves to alleviate ambiguity and equivocation. Ostensibly, the more details provided in the definition, the less ambiguous it becomes. But this is not true. Actually, the more details provided, the more prone is the definition to be ambiguous. A definition must strive to be both minimal and aesthetic. In this sense, it is much like a scientific theory. It talks, it discusses the match or the correlation between language and reality. Reality is parsimonious, and to reflect it, definitions must be as parsimonious as it is. Let us summarize the characteristics of a good definition and then apply them and try to define a few very mundane objects or terms. Well, first of all, a definition must reveal the meaning of the term or concept defined. By meaning, I mean the independent and invariant meaning, not the culturally dependent, narrative-derived type of meaning. The invariant meaning has to do with a function or a use. A term or a concept can have several uses or functions, even conflicting ones, but all of the uses and functions must be universally recognized. Think about marijuana or tobacco. They have medical uses, they have recreational uses. These uses are expressly contradictory, but both are universally acknowledged. So both uses define the meaning of marijuana or tobacco, and they form a part of their definitions. Let us try to construct the first indisputable functional part of the definitions of a few objects or terms. Let's take chair. Chair is intended for sitting. How about game? Game deals with the accomplishment of goals. Window allows you to look through it or allows the penetration of light or air 
when open and not covered. Finally, table is intended for laying things on its surface. It is only when we know the function, the use of the definiendum, that we can begin to look for it. The function or use filters, filters the world and narrows the set of candidates for the definiendum. A definition is a series of superimposed language filters. Only the, the definiendum can penetrate this lineup of filters. It is like a high specificity membrane. Only one term can slip in as the right size, right whole size. The next parameter to look for is the characteristics of the definiendum. In the case of physical objects, we will be looking for physical characteristics, of course. Otherwise, we will be looking for more ephemeral traits. Chair, solid structure, intended for sitting. Game, mental or physical activity of one or more people, the players, which deals with the accomplishment of goals. Window, planar discontinuity in a solid surface, which allows to look through it or for the penetration of light or air when open or not covered. Finally, table, a structure with at least one leg and one flat surface, intended for laying things on the surface. A contrast begins to emerge between a rigorous dictionary lexical language definition and a stipulative definition explaining how the term is to be used. The first, the lexical one, might not be immediately recognizable. The second may be inaccurate, non-universal, or otherwise deficient or lacking. Every definition contrasts the general with the particular. The first part of the definience is almost always the genus, the wider class to which the term belongs. It is only as we refine the definition that we introduce the differentia, the distinguishing features. A good definition allows for the substitution of the define by its definition. A bit awkward if we are trying to define God, for instance, or love, but otherwise a, good, a, a solid principle. This, would, this kind of substitution would be impossible without a union of the general and the particular. A case could be made that a genus is more lexical, while the differentia are more stipulative. But whatever the case may be, a definition must include a genus and a differentia, because as we said, it is bound to reflect reality, and reality is hierarchical and inclusive, the matryushka doll principle. So let's try again. Chair, a solid structure intended for sitting, that's the genus, makes use of at least one bodily axis of the sitter. These are the differentia. Without the differentia, with the genus alone, the definition can well fit a bed or a divan. Game. Mental or physical activity of one or more people, the players, which deals with the accomplishment of goals, that's the genus, in which both the activities and the goals accomplished are reversible, and these are the differentia. Without the differentia, with the genus alone, the definition can well fit most other human activities, which are not games. Window, a planar discontinuity in a solid surface, and that's the genus, which allows to look through it, or for the penetration of light or air when open or not covered. These are the differentia. Without the differentia, take away the differentia. With the genus alone, the definition can well fit a door. Finally, table, a structure with at least one leg and one flat surface, and that is, of course, the genus, intended for laying things on its surface or surfaces, and these are the differentia. Without the differentia, with the genus alone, the definition can well fit the statue of a one-legged soldier holding a tray, for example. It was Locke, who else, who realized 
that there are words whose meaning can be precisely explained but which cannot be defined in this sense. This is either because the explanatory equivalent may require more than genus and differentia, or because some words cannot be defined by means of other words, because those other words also have to, to be defined, and this leads to infinite regression. If we adopt the broad view that the definition is the explanation of meaning by other words, how can we define blue, for example? Only by pointing out examples of blue. And so names of elementary, elementary ideas, colors, for instance, cannot be defined by words, cannot be defined with words. They require an ostensive definition, definition, definition by pointing at something. This is because elementary concepts apply to our experiences, emotions, sensations, sensor, sensory inputs, impressions, sense data. These are usually words in a private language, our private language, which is non-communicable. That's the intersubjectivity problem. How does one communicate, let alone define, the emotions that one experiences during an epiphany? On the contrary, dictionary definitions suffer from gross inaccuracies precisely because they are confined to established meanings. They usually include in the definition things that they should have excluded exclude things that they should have included or get it altogether wrong. Stipulative or ostensive definitions cannot be wrong by definition. <laughs> they may conflict with the lexical dictionary definition and they may diverge from established meanings. This may prove to be both confusing and costly, for example, in legal matters, but this has nothing to do with their accuracy or truthfulness. Additionally, both types of definition may be insufficiently explanatory. They may be circular or obscure, leaving more than one possibility open, ambiguous, equivocal, and so on and so forth. Many of these problems are solved when we introduce context into the definition. Context has four conceptual pillars, time, place, cultural, and mental mental characteristics. A definition which is able to incorporate all four elements of context, all four contextual elements, is, is monovalent, unequivocal, unambiguous, precise, universal, appropriately exclusive and inclusive, aesthetic and parsimonious. So context is crucial to defining things, as we will see in, um, in part two. Let's try again to define chair, game, window, and so on and so forth, using everything we have learned. Chair, artificial, that's the context, artificial solid structure intended for sitting, and that is the genus, makes use of at least one bodily axis of the sitter, that's differentia, without the context the definition can well fit an appropriately shaped rock. rock. So, the context is critical here, the artificiality of a chair. Game. Mental or physical activity of one or more people, the players, subject to agreed rules of confrontation, collaboration and scoring. This would be the context, which deals with the accomplishment of goals, that's the genus, in which both the activities and goals accomplished are reversible. Differentia. Take away the context and the definition can well fit most other non-playing human activities. Window. A planar discontinuity in a solid surface. A, sorry, a planar discontinuity in a solid artificial surface. The artificial element, the element of artificiality is the context. So, Planar discontinuity in a solid artificial surface, which is the genus, which allows to look through it of the penetration of light or air when not covered or open, and these are the differentia, take away the context, take away the artificiality, and the definition can well fit a hole in a rock, for example. It is easy to notice that the distinction between the differentia and the context 
is rather blurred. Many of the differentia are the result of cultural and historical contexts. A lot of the context emerges from the critical mass of differentia, and so on and so forth. There's an interplay between them. We have confined our discussion hitherto to the structural elements of a definition. But a definition is a dynamic process. It involves the sentence doing the defining, the process of defining, and the resulting defining expression, definience. The interaction between different definitions of definition give rise to numerous forms of equivalence, all called definitions. Real definitions, nominal definitions, prescriptive, contextual, recursive, inductive, persuasive, impredicative, extensional, intentional with S definitions, these are stars in a galaxy of alternative models of explanation. But it all boils down to the same truth. It is the type of definition chosen and the righteousness and the rigorousness with which we understand the meaning of definition that determine which words can and cannot be defined. In my view, there is still a mistaken belief that there are objects or terms which can be defined without going outside the specified realm, the set of terms. People are trying to define life or love by resorting to chemical reactions. And this reductionism inevitably and invariably leads to the Locke paradoxes. It is true that a definition must include all the necessary conditions to the definiendum. Chemical reactions are a necessary condition to life, but they are not sufficient conditions. A definition must include all the sufficient conditions as well as the necessary conditions. So let's attempt to do the impossible. Let's define definition itself. A definition is a statement which captures, captures the meaning, the use, the function, and the essence of an object, a term, or a concept. Next part deals with context and meaning.